about is they really don't want us to wait until something like that happens because you know everybody is outraged and they're upset and how could this happen? And then we kind of die down and we forget about it. And the next thing you know, somebody gets dressed up like Batman, goes into a movie theater and does it again. And then we're up here with our, uh, our anxiety level and it kind of goes down again. So we want to be more proactive. And, and that's the purpose of this seminar. Uh, before I go any further, I just want to say, I see we have one youngster in the audience. There are two specific parts of this presentation uh, that are really not meant for children. And we would ask the young man to step out. I think you're under 18, aren't you? <laughs> Uh, one, we have to do with uh, some of the stuff on the internet, as you can imagine. And one it has to do with warning signs, and we're going to show some graphic footage from Columbine, which uh, for some reason started at all, even though, uh, as we know from the last seminar, uh, school violence is not a new phenomenon. It's been around since the 1600s, believe it or not. We, we documented cases back that far. Um, so uh, I just want to introduce who's going to be the presenters. Um, first of all, this is Sergeant George Smith, Radnor Township Police. Uh, next to George is Detective T.J. Schreiber. He's one of our detectives in Radnor Township. Uh, and next to Detective Schreiber, and I just got her card, excuse me, I gotta use my glasses, um, is Rosanna Power. She's an investigative analyst for the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. All right, so that should be very interesting. Uh, and next to uh, Rosanna, we have Lieutenant Christopher Flanagan. He's in charge of special operations. And next to Lieutenant Flanagan is Lieutenant Andy Block, who's in charge of operations. And Andy also does things on a periodic basis at the school regarding uh, educating parents about what their children are into. And needless to say, Andy could elaborate when it's his turn to speak uh, how shocked some parents are what, what children are doing nowadays. Uh, so that they're, they're going to be your speakers. Uh, this is going to be a quick moving program. We hope it's going to be informative. Uh, we hope it's going to scare you a little bit too, uh, because this is reality. Not to make you paranoid, but just to make you more aware. So I'd like to introduce now the president of the Board of Commissioners, uh, Elaine Schaefer, for opening remarks. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. I am so glad to see so many people. And thanks for those people who are watching this at home. I think we're all here for the same reason. You know, we, we share an understanding that, you know, one of the key ingredients, probably the most important ingredient in having a successful and healthy community is having confidence, a high level of confidence that our children and our young people are safe from harm. And it seems like a pretty simple concept, but um, it's sometimes hard to achieve. And when I say safe from harm, I, I mean all kinds of harm, physical harm and emotional harm. And harm can come from all kinds of places. It can come from people. And now, as we all know, more and more, it comes from the internet. And it can be a little bit more subtle and hard to follow and hard to keep up with. I have three teenagers myself, and it's very hard to keep up with the next thing that they're on and they're sharing and they're using. Um, but it's so important. Luckily, here in Radnor Township, we have a, an incredibly dedicated and professional and savvy police force who um, work on this all the time, all year long. And they are keeping up with what the next thing is and what's going on and what our kids are doing, even when we can't. Um, and they are constantly figuring out ways to keep us protected and, more importantly, ways for us to protect ourselves. And that is what we're here to learn a little bit about tonight, how they're protecting us and how we can better protect ourselves and our own children and young people. So again, thank you for coming out. I want to say thank you so much to our police force who works on this, not just this presentation tonight, but all year long, every year. So thank you again, and uh, enjoy the evening. Thanks. Uh, the cornerstone of this seminar tonight, uh, who is also the facilitator, who's responsible for the bulk of the work that went into this tonight, uh, is, is Sergeant George Smith. So I'm going to turn it over to him now. Thank you. <clears throat> Pardon me. What we did was we tried to open up to pre-registration, the point being that we got your email addresses. There is so much information that we went through to put this presentation together, we want to make it available to you. So 
what we're going to do after this presentation is email it out to you so you have direct links where you're able to click on what you want and go. So we try to put a lot of helpful information in front of you. Links, PDFs, websites on a multitude of issues related to what we're going to be talking about tonight. So if you haven't already, sometime tonight, make sure you register. We're going to keep our registration open on the website for another week to aid in people automatically registering so we can force that information out. So with no further ado, I want to thank the co-presenters tonight and Lieutenant Block. Uh, good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone here this evening. Uh, we're going to start our program. And the first thing we'd like to do is to update everybody from our last uh, school safety seminar back in January. One of the things that the police department, specifically Superintendent Colorado, had offered to all the schools was for the police department to come out and do a walkthrough and an assessment of schools. And I'm very happy to report that there were several schools within the township that actually took us up on that offer. And I'm very happy to report that the following schools that I have up on the screen here um, did take some of the uh, recommendations that we made to harden the target. And when we talk about hardening the target, the schools in this area are very safe, but there are certain aspects and areas of this school that we looked at that could have been vulnerable. And we made some recommendations, and like I said, uh, the Ratner School District as a whole for the three elementary schools, Ethan Wayne, and Ele uh, Wayne Elementary, Radnor Middle School, as well as the high school, harden their target by now having a buzz-in system. So if you go to any one of the schools during the day, you cannot access the school. You must go to the main entrance. You must uh, activate the buzzer. Uh, video screen comes on, and then you converse with the administrative staff in the main office. You have to state the reason that you're there. Then they will permit you in, and you have to register and obtain a visitor pass in the office. So that's one of the examples of where the target was hardened. Um, in addition to that, we had the Country Day School of Sacred Heart, who has made uh, multiple uh, upgrades to the school because um, they have a very unique campus where there's two separate buildings down there. Uh, in addition to that, St. Catherine's School in Wayne, uh, the Lane Montessori School at the Wayne United Methodist Church, the New Gulf's Children's Center, and right now we're currently working with Archbishop Carroll, reviewing their plans and making some recommendations with them as well. So it was very well received, and that offer still stands for any other schools that are within the confines of Radnor Township that would be more than happy to come out and do a walkthrough um, with the administrators and the, and the staff uh, to harden the target. Safety's first. The other thing that happened, it started in the spring of 2013, is that Delaware County, through uh, the Delaware County Council, as well as the Delaware County District Attorney's Office, were able to establish a program and fund the program for the PASS system. And it's essentially what it does is it provides uh, an alarm in each school in Delaware County. And under the Del Pass alarm system, it immediately goes to the 911 center. It's used only in, in grave extreme circumstances, and it states right on here. It's activated when there's an armed intruder or other person presenting with a farm, gun, bomb, or instrument capable of inflicting imminent death or serious bodily injury to any persons on school property. So currently it's being installed in all the schools in Delaware County. Uh, it's twofold. One, it sends the alarm out. And it also has the capabilities of locking open a speaker system so they can get information in the 911 center and then pass that along to the responding police and emergency units that uh, are en route to the specific school if there is an emergency. So that is progress. And uh, to date, all the Radnor Township schools have the system installed at the uh, three elementary schools, the middle school, as well as the high school. And we just received information um, late this afternoon. As I say, it's, a, it's an ongoing uh, process. The Academy of Notre Dame, uh, the Country Day School of Sacred Heart, New Gulf Children's Center, St. David's Nursery School, and St. Catherine's Elementary have just recently had this installed as well. So again, this is progress. This is progress in the right direction, again, as far as hardening the target and keeping open lines of communication with the schools, the community, and the police department. So I'm very happy to present uh, this information this evening. And, and again, our offer stands will come out at any time. In addition to that, as you're well aware, and if you're not, the Radnor Township Police Department is committed to the safety of every child in, in this township, specifically with the schools. We do daily visits. We do walkthroughs. And to date, there's been over 435 visits performed in all the schools in Radnor Township. And we'll continue and we're endeavored to do that. That's very important. It's a very important part of our, our program. So I'll turn it back over to Sergeant Smith. Thank you again.
One of the interesting things, as you could see, that Lieutenant Block showed you, 11 schools took us up on our offer to do a safety assessment. And everybody was very humble. Nobody, you know, got offended when we, when we made recommendations. And we were really uh, uh, blunt and, 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 you know, we were, we didn't have any tact. If we thought something was unsafe, we said, you know, this is ridiculous. Anybody could walk in here or, you know, the service window, we could jump over and have access. And they listened to us, which was, which was good. And, and like Andy said, you know, school safety, safety of our children, I said this before, I'll say it again. A community is judged first and foremost on how safe we keep our children. Nothing else matters more so than that. So uh, George is gonna start with cyberbullying, which unfortunately is another thing that you can contribute to our advanced technology. Welcome. Cyberbullying and internet safety. It's a unique topic. 15 years ago, we probably wouldn't have been talking about cyberbullying. Instead, just straight schoolyard bullying. Well, now with the World Wide Web, they have access all over the world. And as this presentation continues, you'll see why that's so very important to try and stay in front of it because as adults technology seems to pass us by but as the, the children grow they just hang on to it and get as much out of it as they can so what is cyberbullying it's basically schoolyard bullying on either the internet computer iPad texting cell phone smartphone all of it and the worst part about cyberbullying, it can be anonymous. So you don't have to see who is bullying you. You just see the results. How do they do it? They don't have to go through this whole wheel. Some have better things they like doing and some like intimidation and gossip and you'll see why. Gossip, just like that first video showed, they sent hurtful messages to a female and just make her feel real bad. Why is that important for teachers and parents? Because your kids are growing up. You see them, we don't. We only see them when it's the worst. You see them daily. So this is important to understand. Outing and trickery. In my time as a police officer here, we've investigated cases where friends would befriend others, get their passwords, get their phone numbers, get their PIN numbers, and stuff on that phone then gets put onto the World Wide Web. It never comes back. It's out there forever. As, as much as we may try to get it removed, we're not always successful. So outing and trickery is one of the big things. Exclusion. You see this a lot with the preteens, the tweeners, and the early teens, the group dynamics. Um, in all the research that I did for this program, all of the experts are saying the same exact thing. The gossip, the outing, the trickery, the exclusion. And this term relational aggression keeps coming up. They put it more for interpersonal relationships with females as they grow up. I found that odd. I'm like, okay. But basically it's when the girlfriends get together and they won't play with you because of whatever reason. Oh, you can't play with me, I'm playing with her. Boys growing up, okay, you, you don't wanna play? We move on or we take it out back and we did the old push each other around, see who's you know, stronger and all that. Girls don't do that. They take it to an extreme. Relational aggression is very important. Impersonation. When we break the pins or they steal the pins or personal information or security codes 
from computers, they now have the ability to break into your Facebook account, your Tumblr account, your Instagram account, all of those accounts, and put out messages. You know, Some of the messages are hurtful. Some of them are disinformation. They all lead to trouble. And as parents, it's imperative for us to understand and impart in our children about security of personal information. We hear in this police business, identity theft, identity theft, identity theft. And we just think it's you know, credit card fraud and all of that. They steal identities of children and build tremendous amounts of credit information and data from them. And those children, if their credit is ruined by the time they're 16 or 18, that's a, that's a long hill to, to go up. So part of our job is to help you inform your kids. Personal information is very important. You don't need to share it. You shouldn't share it. There are dangers in sharing it with other people, even the so-called friends. You know, you'll, you'll see some cases that we put forward here about people befriending another to get the PIN information, to get access, and then they labeled their flaming attacks and their outing attacks and all of the attacks that you see when you do this research, it's just nasty. It's very, very nasty. And when it's out there, it does never come back. It, it, it just stays out there. Harassment. We see this when your children are at their wits end or you have a student that just can't take it anymore. And then the final straw is you come to the police. There are many steps in between that people, teachers, staff, administration had an opportunity to help arrest that situation. The crimes code in Pennsylvania is very black and white. When it comes to us, it either meets the elements of the crime or it doesn't. We can't look at it's a 15-year-old or a 16-year-old or a 17-year-old. It doesn't matter to us. They broke the law. And in consultation with the DA's office, we prosecute the crime because that's exactly what it is. Somebody is harassed and it's, it's not legal. Cyber stalking. I always like to claim myself as a cyber stalker. I have a Facebook account, probably 32 friends. Yeah, I just stalk. I don't post because it's not good things. Good things don't happen to police when they post. So I, I learned. But what child has 600 friends? Don't you find that interesting? A teenager or, or a tweener, 600 and sometimes many more. So what are they doing? They're just blindly befriending people on the internet. Anonymity, you don't know if it's a 60 year old pedophile. It could just as easily be that 12 year old or that convicted felon, you don't know. Flaming, obviously, you've seen that the video, you know, goes back and forth, back and forth, and usually the victim of flaming, they're not the ones that send anything back, and all the research says, that's, that's how you should be. Don't inflame the flaming situation. Bring it to somebody's attention, block your accounts, move forward with distancing that person, distancing that social media site, start anew. Cyber threats, again, that's when the police get involved. When it's something this serious, we take it very serious. Warning signs, why is this important? On the handouts on the table and what we'll be sending via email, Montgomery County has put a cyberbullying and bullying task force manual together. And these warning signs have been pulled from it. The good thing about it is it breaks it down into very simplistic forms. What teachers can do, what administrators can do, what parents can do. By the time it gets to police, we already know what to do. And we're very limited. It's, we look, the elements of the crime are there, we will charge. And we'll prosecute and move forward. And a 15, 16, 17-year-old, you know, if you're the parent of that 16, 17-year-old, you're not gonna want prosecution because it really does complicate lives. Warning signs. I drew the red line in, in between because above the red line 
is the old school bullying. The signs that you're going to see, the torn clothes and missing items, the things of that nature. The physical manifestation of bullying. Below that, teachers, parents, you see this every day. Loss of interest. Grades that are going down. We never see that. That's, that's the first sign for you guys. Low self-esteem, especially if you're instructing in a tweener's age where we're, we're coming into our own identity. It's pretty important to keep an eye on it. Who does it affect? 43% of 13 to 17 year olds experience some sort of cyberbullying. This is from 2007. Five years later, I guarantee you it's a lot higher. The reason being, e-marketing, who put this chart together, 69% increase in smartphone usage for kids ages 12 to 17. Why is that important? Because smartphones are just as powerful as desktop computers. Smartphones can get you on the internet, get your Tumblr account, get your Facebook account, get your Instagram account, and have access to some web websites that we're going to be showing you a little bit later. Jessica Long, uh, Logan, 17-year-old, victim of cyberbullying, finally broke after she visited a boyfriend who committed suicide himself, went home, committed suicide. Ryan Halligan. This was an indication of someone that was befriended, hijacked his accounts, flamed him, outed him, and he couldn't take the ridicule and killed himself. Phoebe Prince, going to the cotillion. She was called the Irish slut and just was totally out it and gossiped and couldn't take it and committed suicide.
So what can we do? Wonderful site out there is internetsafety101.org. They have a list for parents and they have a list for teachers and administrators on what is helpful. Rule number two, in a household, there is no way a child should be the administrator for your home network, none whatsoever. Because if you give a child the authority to set passwords, to do monitoring, you have just given the, the keys to the kingdom. So as parents, we need, and we need to do it. If we can't, then we find people or groups that can. You need to know what your kids are posting, what websites they're visiting, why they're visiting them, and like I said earlier, why they have 600 friends on their Facebook account. You want to discourage the interaction on websites where they use video. You, as you'll see in a demonstration a little bit later in this presentation, why it is so important to heed this warning. And as I said, rule seven, personal information is personal information and it should be guarded like it's money or gold, it's valuable. And never, ever arrange a face-to-face -face meeting. Your 12-year-old or your 14-year-old thinks they're going with a 12 or a 14-year-old meeting because they're cool. That could be the 56-year-old pedophile or convicted felon, or the person that's on Megan's list. You don't know who it is. They definitely don't know who it is. So for their safety and your peace of mind, you need to have this conversation. I put this slide thinking, you know what? Parents, you need to be the NSA. Not good, TJ. You need to monitor who they're calling, who they're accessing, what websites they're going to, what videos, what emails they're sending out. Not to be their best bud or their friend, but to be their parent. Out of all the computers, uh, when I was doing this research, I came across a, a very good book that's going to be part of the email blast out. Tells you every parental software out there. Its costs, its strengths, its weaknesses. Gives you sites that you can visit. This is one of the ones, if you're not aware, that I really want to just take a, a moment out of this presentation and talk about. As the administrator, you have the ability to block sites. When they get on www or use Google or use any of the other search engines, you can limit pornography. Obviously, we know we don't want a 12-year-old or 14-year-old, male or female, surfing for pornography. Gambling, that's probably a good idea to prohibit that too. But it even goes as far as employment, religion, personals, you want your 11 or 14 year old surfing the personal column? No. There's chat rooms out there. There's dangerous areas on the World Wide Web that you have to take an active role in helping your children navigate these waters. And the first step is getting parental software on your computers. Everybody's heard of Norton. These, this is just another example of it. You're only limited to the amount of money you want to put forward with a parental software package. That first one, Net Nanny, in all. Uh oh. Was it?
We'll see. My apologies for the technical difficulty. What's that? Well, while that's booting up, let me ask you a question. Very riveting so far by Sergeant Smith. Don't you agree? If anybody didn't have a lump in their throat when they were showing pictures of those kids, you know, I don't know what to say. But, um, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I'll be the one that admits it. I have no idea what a Tumblr account is or Instagram or anything like that. And, and as parents, luckily my son's 30 years old, so I don't have to worry about it. But as parents, you know, we're forced oh, to, to have to learn that. I went to school in the 60s and the 70s, and I went to Catholic school, Sisters of St. Joseph, and then Bishop Newman. Um, and they kept talking to, and trying to teach us about the metric system, how someday we were going to go to the metric system. You know why we never went to the metric system? Because Americans were too lazy to learn it. That's why. Because we were supposed to go metric like everybody else in the world. We can't have that same mentality when it comes to these computers. We just can't, especially if you have children. George, go ahead. Chief, thank you. I appreciate that. I apologize for the, the problem. But it basically, what's out there is you can tailor to what you want, how techno-savvy you are, how techno-savvy you're not, and it will walk you through it. And we can't forget these items. Uh, here's an example of Norton. And basically, all the websites and all the research says you can't hide from the internet. It's there. It's never going to go away. But you have to have the communication with your children. And as teachers or staff, I'm sure you have an understanding of where technology plays in education. So if you're out front and open and honest and establish some rules that everybody can live with and you can operate safely, that is beneficial for everybody involved. Here's a, one software, NetNanny, that it crosses both the app market and the computer market. And, and you're scratching your head, well, why the app market? Well, the app market is just as dangerous as the internet. And there are so many ways that children can be pulled in and lured by people that do nothing every day except for try to lure children in and take advantage of them. So that's one avenue that you need to be mindful of. Desktop is kind of old and antiquated, believe it or not. So you have your iPads and your tablets and your laptop when it doesn't run out of battery. Um, but your phone, more importantly. So don't forget that when you're looking at this total package. One, one avenue that I want to make clear with everybody is you're only limited by the amount of energy you put forward into protecting your kids. Uh, the next uh, presenter is going to be Lieutenant Christopher Flanagan. Uh, one of the things I want you to remember that George said, uh, a lot of these times, our, our kids think they're talking to another child, but they're really not. And you'll see that later on in the demonstration. And if you think stuff like this doesn't happen in Radnor, and if you think cyberbullying or, or uh, internet safety just pertains to our children, let me give you a couple of really quick true stories. I'm a trusting soul. I give people my cell phone number. We had a 70-year-old man that texted me saying he buried a body. And Lieutenant Block spent numerous man hours looking for shallow graves in Radnor Township. Well, what made this more disturbing? The 70-year-old man who had my cell phone number, who I thought was someone who was concerned about his community, 
used an 11 year old girl's phone to send that text message. He's since been arrested. We also had uh, a phone with a sex video with teenagers that was stolen and posted on YouTube. We also had a child that sent images of himself to a grown man on a site that Detective Schreiber is going to talk about later on. And to top it off, we had another individual that posted on Facebook under a fictitious name and had pictures of underage girls from, I believe, Radnor High School and Conestoga. But he kind of did something else to the pictures before he reposted them. Now, fortunately for us, we've cleared most of these incidents, but God knows how many times they happen that we don't know about. So Lieutenant Flanagan's going to talk about sexting. Again, another new phenomenon because of our advanced technology. Thank you, Chief. I want to thank everybody for coming and uh, educating yourself. This is going to be a little different where we watch videos from Sergeant Smith's presentation where people were the victim. This is where the tables could turn. Your child could be the victim or, as we call it, could be the actor. Um, sexting. We define sexting as the sending or receiving of sexually explicit or sexually suggestive images or video via a cell phone. Most commonly, the term has been used to describe incidents where teenagers take nude or semi-nude pictures of themselves and distribute those pictures to others using their cell phones and as we spoke about any type of electronic thing that can transmit one of those images. The images are often initially sent to romantic partners or interests but can find their way into the hands of others, which ultimately is what creates the problems. While the public is most concerned about these behaviors as they occur among adolescents, there's also evidence that adults are involved in this. But what we're seeing, and we actually have a case study where um, two consenting juveniles had a sexual relationship. They recorded it in vivid HD imaging um, and they kept it amongst themselves. However, either because one of the people had talked about it or let somebody use their cell phone, people became aware of the situation. Very unfortunately, what I will call an evil plot was planned and executed successfully by stealing one of those people's phones. The phone was then quickly, in I believe under three minutes, it was transmitted to the entire senior group of one of the local schools. So in three minutes, two lives were dramatically changed. And what ended up happening is fortunately, um, everybody's still doing okay, but many people were charged with serious offenses of the crimes code. Um, one of the things that came up out of that is that the two people who were consenting in their relationship were also charged because they were in possession of uh, pornographic images. And it's very important that you educate yourself um, and then share that information with your children, students, friends, family, that this goes beyond just being the person you're protecting from, that you can actually become somebody, what we call an offender, where you've committed a crime and it involves a lot of people and it can be very serious. The statistic chart here shows a couple different studies where if you look, the percentage who sent and on the right side is the percentage who received. We could go over them for a while, but the long and short is very easy once they're sent that it just continues to grow and grow and multiply. And as many people have been told before, once an image is out in cyberspace, it's always out there, no matter how hard you try, no matter what you think you've done to protect yourself. Um, sexting by age, um, Sergeant Smith um, showed one of his slides was an increase of up to 69% of young people will have access to the phones. We're finding that a phone is something that's so easily accessible. I don't think a lot of people, if you had a dinner party, would let people sit down and use your personal computer. That would be, hey, you know, that's, that's my computer, I do my finances, other things, private emails. But think about how many times your kid or you lend a cell phone to somebody. And if you're capturing those images, which you shouldn't be in the first place, but if you're capturing those images, how easy is it for those people to intercept them and send them? And it just goes on and on from there. As we can see the graph, it just continues to grow and the future is dim because of the easy access and low cost of phones as they continue to go. Um, there was a comment made by a local New Jersey law uh, representative, look, kids do stupid things, impulsive things all the time. We need to approach this problem logically. And we're saying this is a serious matter. This isn't just kids. The reason the legislators have placed these laws 
um, in an action is to avoid this problem, and it's serious. And as the back end of this, we can see what happens with bullying and being embarrassed and how people can literally end their lives because of this type of activity. The law is measuring up that you're going to be charged. Your children can be charged and will be charged, and it'll go to the district attorney's office, and it ends up being a very serious offense. The scales of justice are supposed to serve everybody, but we need to understand that victims can be described in a couple different ways. I'm going to go through this real quickly, but the long and short of it is 63, chapter 63 of our Crimes Code talks about how people are to be charged if they're in possession or um, transmit pornography. And it can now, it's such a prevalent problem that the juveniles have a charge in 6321 of the Crimes Code, where it's a misdemeanor two or a misdemeanor three for possessing, transmitting, and also using these, um, using these to possibly harass, annoy, or anything else to these people. So sexting is a big issue. Um, take time to think about it. And thank you very much for your time. One of the sad things about um, with these, these smartphones, uh, you ever see that evolutionary chart of the progression of man starts out as an ape and then they go up, right? Well, now you see everybody who's walking around and they got their heads down on the phone. They cross the street, they don't even look where they're going. It's amazing, you know. Uh, you know, we're all guilty of it too, let's be honest. But um, I just have to warn you with this, this next segment is extremely graphic. So if anybody's going to be offended by genitalia, uh, you could step out of the room. And I'll, I'll tell you the, the importance of why we're doing this. Back in June, a 12-year-old young man came in with his father. Um, we discovered a website where this 12-year-old this was communicating with a person in his 20s that we believe was from New York. We never solved this case. Uh, this 12-year-old uh, sent pictures of his penis to this man. Uh, TJ told me about the website, and he's going to describe it. Uh, we did a press conference, and uh, I did real time, live time, and I pretended I was a 13-year-old girl. And I tried to talk like a 13-year-old girl with a little smiley face. And I'm no professional uh, like we have here. Within 30 seconds, within 30 seconds, I had pedophiles contacting me, asking me to send nude pictures, saying offensive things to me, and it was incredible. And then TJ went one step further, and you can actually just randomly hook up with a stranger. Every single person that came on that screen, and again, I'm not going to mince words here. Every single person that came up was already masturbating, not knowing what the image was going to be on the other side. This is what your kids are clicking on. So I'm going to let TJ walk you through this. It's going to be extremely graphic, but this is what your kids have access to. Thanks, Chief. I'm Detective T.J. Schreiber with Radner here. Um, a lot of my cases that I, I see and I deal with uh, involve computers and more, more likely than not the cell phone. Cell phones are, are bigger, as you guys have heard. Um, there are many computers. They have internet capability. Um, I'm going to pick on Apple because I think probably that's the majority. Most people have uh, iPhones. Um, they have great security for, for, our, for you guys, but as far as finding out for your kids, they're extremely difficult for law enforcement to deal with. Um, I had a death investigation this past summer where a 22-year-old uh, uh, had died. Um, his father and I were trying to get into his cell phone to see what his last texts, what his last calls were uh, before his death. Called Apple on a three-way call with the father who owned the iPhone, owned the account. And uh, we were both told by Apple that the only thing they could do for us would be to reset the phone, that they would not provide the PIN code to us at all. So. That's what Apple said. They said, you can mail it to us, we will reset it, we will show you reset. But from a law enforcement perspective, a blank phone does nothing for us. The evidence would be gone. Um, Apple's text messages, if it shows up in blue, if you guys have iPhones, that is not going to show up on your phone bill as a text message. It will just, it's internet based, so it stays within Apple. So if they're texting somebody iPhone to iPhone, you're not going to see it. Um, they remain a few steps ahead of us uh, for law enforcement. We do have programs out there that help, um, but like I said, we're Right now, Apple's ahead of, of us right now. So if you do have something on an iPhone or, or Droid or any smartphone that you think your kids are involved in anything, whether it's text, pictures, what I would recommend to do is put it in airplane mode immediately. That shuts off communication from the outside world. So they can't remotely erase it, 
or send or receive or anything like that. Uh, if you guys take it, there's programs out there on iPhone. You can go on your iCloud and erase the phone. In airplane mode, you can't do that. Um, obviously, confiscate it and then call us, report it to the police. Uh, they're using these apps through the, through the iPhones, um, peer-to-peer apps. Facebook's one of them. I have a Facebook as well. Sorry, Sarge. I have about 300 friends. So, um, But everybody's on Facebook. The, the best security, what I would tell you, would be tell your kids not to have a Facebook, but who's going to do that? that that's unrealistic. Um, what I would recommend, you could uh, have your children, you should know the passwords to everything, uh, pin codes to the phone, passwords, email addresses, and Facebook takes multiple ones, so whatever one they're using, you should know all the email addresses. Uh, change your name or have your kids use your first and middle name, don't use a last name. So uh, Jim Jones, maybe go by Jim James and not your last name. Or change a letter in your name. So instead of saying Jim Jones, spell your name on Facebook, JVM Jones. Uh, it's less searchable for the outside world. Um, if you go into your security settings, you can, you can make, if, if your child's under 18, you can make it that anybody over 18 cannot view their profile in, unless you know, they are friends with them. So, so people over 18 can't go on there and find a 14-year-old, uh, things like that. Uh, put everything as high as you can as far as uh, parental controls and restrictions. Uh, pictures that are posted on Facebook are not, you have no rights to those, they're public. There's a website out there right now, and I have an active case, so I, I can't really tell you guys the website, but what they're doing is they're taking profile pictures, uh, mostly of girls. They're posting them on this website, and they're asking, does anybody have what they call as a win, which is basically a nude photo of, they'll say the, the, the girl's name and last initial, so Jane C. from Radnor High School, and they'll put, the post, they'll put her profile picture up there and ask if anybody has any nude photos, and then people post the nude photos if they have them. Um, I've gotten nowhere with that site as far as taking it down. They're out of Jamaica, and uh, they pretty much tell us to go pound sand. They won't, they won't cooperate. So um, that's another bad one. Um, the Instagram probably is number two on the list. It's on the rise. It's on the rise among younger people. It's trending younger. Um, we actually we're, we're having cases we've seen where they're creating for teachers out there fake accounts on Instagram using a teacher's name, and then they're friending all the students in the school. Um, we've had two cases of that so far uh, in, the, in the recent past. And then there's, there's apps, peer-to-peer -peer apps, Snapchat, Kick Messenger. They're internet app-based on the phone. You can take a picture on your phone and send it to each other. That picture doesn't go in your camera roll. It stays within the app. So basically, they're, they're sexting pictures back and forth. They're not using their cell phone. So it's not going to show up in your phone bill. They're going to create a username, and they're sending it that way. So the, the phone number's not out there. And the case that the chief uh, talked about, um, they're on a site called Omegle. Basically, it promotes uh, talking to strangers. Go on the site Omegle, and I'm going to do it for you guys when I'm done, a live demonstration. And they'll go, what's your name, age, sex, location? They'll use the ASL, and then you, you'll put in whatever. And then they'll say, what is your kick? Well, that's a kick ID. They'll go to the phones, and they'll start uh, chatting back and forth, sending pictures. Um, Omegle is a stopping grounds for predators, perverts, like the chief said, and you guys are going to see. Uh, Any time of the day, there's roughly about 30,000 people online, and there's actually a counter on the website, which will show that. Um, they're looking, most of these guys are looking for photos, so they're going to exchange photos. In, in, in rare cases, they're looking to meet up with the juvenile uh, for a meet. I would say 90% of the time, they're looking for photos for personal use. You guys can figure out what that is. But um, we did have a case uh, last year where a, a, a young girl, a 13-year-old, was using one of these, these apps. It was called Party in My Dorm, which is just like the kick. She was chatting back and forth uh, with a 20-year-old male from Virginia who managed to hitchhike his way up to Pennsylvania, convinced the girl to run away with him, um, was missing for a few days. She was they were both apprehended uh, with the help of uh, the U.S. Marshals down in Washington, D.C. He is currently serving 15 to 30 years in state prison. He pled guilty, which is the, one of the largest guilty pleas in Delaware County in the recent history. So I won't go too much far into it, but he had no good intentions, and it was all over. It all started over a cell phone app. And, you know, parents had no idea. When we started uncovering information, had no idea. You've got to be on top of your kids uh, as far as the Internet usage. Uh, you've got to use transparency. Until they turn 18, that phone's yours, the phone's in your name. Passwords, pins, everything you guys have to know. Uh, we work uh, in conjunction with the Delaware County District Attorney's Office Internet Crimes Against Children Unit uh, in, in uncovering these crimes. We actually have a representative here, Rosanna, if anybody has any questions at the end. Uh, she does this for a living. 
and uh, they are a great resource for us and they help us in our investigations. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go on a website. Everybody here is 18, correct? Okay. And the problem with this too, excuse me, uh, like TJ just said, this Omegle or Omegle, however you pronounce it, is based in Canada. So that really, you know, makes it difficult for us to find out who the, who the people are that are sending these messages. All right, so this is Omegle. This is exactly what it will look like on your computer. There is an app for Omegle as well for the iPhone and Android. You can see the Apple logo up here. I'm going to start. You can type in an interest, but we're not even going to do that. We're just going to go text, and it's going to say it's connecting you with a random stranger. So here's the stranger's types, male or female. So I'll, I will be a female. And I'll be 14. So he's a male. He's asking me where I'm from, 16. Odds are he's not 16. But we're not going to continue with the juvenile, so we'll move on. This isn't that hard to find somebody of age here. So I'll start out ASL, which is age, sex, location. So she's 15 in the female USA. So we're in a. So 14 female Philadelphia. They didn't like that. Maybe they're looking for a war. And you got to learn the lingo. If you start saying, how old are you, they're going to know you're cops. So you just kind of. <laughs> 21 male USA. So there's an adult. Let's see if he continues to talk to me. He thinks I'm 14. A lot of times they'll ask you, do you want to do Skype? Do you want to do Kick? He's thinking about it. <laughs> well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try to bait this guy. I'm to see if he says, you know, you want a Skype or whatever, uh, which I'll then x him out. So I mean, look. Do you have kick? There it is. So that's what I talked about. So I'm going to say yes. So what he wants to do is now go private. So if I had in my cell phone and I had kick sign in, he's going to probably give me his, his user ID, which is then it's going to go text to text, which is not discoverable to parents. It doesn't show up anywhere. What's your ID? He asked for mine, so we'll get rid of this guy. Let me see if he writes back. I'll be a guy this time, 13 male USA. See, he didn't want to talk to me.
kick. He wants to kick right away. So they're just going on here to meet and then they're going to kick. So I'm going to go to video chat now. This is going to be a little bit different. Let's see if he gets back to me. So what I'm going to do is actually I've got to get out of the way. I find it more if you have a camera on. They, they're more, they keep you online longer. Now, now when he goes to video chat, I want you to remember these images that pop up is what the kids see as soon as they click on this. Yeah. Most of these guys are trying to get probably a girl on here, which is not as many as mostly dudes, but they're trying to get a girl. They'll just keep hitting refresh till they find a girl. Um, a lot of them are capturing this conversation, so if they, whatever they do with each other, they are recording the screen and then they're posting it on pornographic websites. So I'm just going to cover up the webcam and start a video. Right now, all these people are alive. It's a kid. think he's going to do. Wait. There's a girl. And if you get a black screen, that just means their camera's off. I'm going to do is type in an interest. Type in. What are you younger? Girls or younger? You want me younger? Girls? Uh, oh, yeah. You can, you can tell me Girls will get more hits, most likely. Men.
So as you can see, guys, the, you go on this website, it's not for good intentions. They're not going on here for good intentions. Um, I did talk to Rosanna. They do cooperate, but they're overwhelmed with the amount of requests. Is that correct? So. Oh, sorry. They do see child pornography or exploitation. They will report it to the National Center and then send us a cyber tip for it, which comes right to our office, and then we send it out to the state of Pennsylvania. So they are cooperating, um, but it is very difficult because they are such a small operation. Same with kick. If your kids have kick, tell them to get rid of it. <laughs> That's my, my advice uh, because it's not used for any good intention, just like Omega isn't, and they think that they can circumvent their text messaging or data usage and that you won't find out about it because it is an application. Um, so just, just keep an eye out on their, uh, on their phones for that. Can you see it on their phone? Like it's, an app? it's an app. You can see it right on their phone. And you can, you know, if you can monitor that as well. And, you know, with Net Nanny and these parental controls, you can block those. You can block them from having those. But every presentation that I go to in this county, you ask the kids, you know, middle school, high school age, who has kick? And they all raise their hands. Most of them don't have Facebook. They use Instagram, um, not Facebook, but Instagram is owned by Facebook and they are very cooperative uh, with law enforcement. So just, just be aware. No, you can delete it. Yeah, you can delete it and you know every now and then check their phone and make sure that they don't have it. Um, it really just comes down to you know, parenting them and keeping an eye on that uh, and making sure you know, that they're not hiding it from you or just uploading it again. Um, so your best bet is to try to block it. <coughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry, George. And as Detective Schreiber pointed out, if you noticed in all the videos that did show up, they were in an isolated part of the house, probably a bedroom, with their earbuds in and a laptop. And how many times do you allow your kids to go to a different part of the house and do that? Are you feeling more comfortable talking about that parental software? I know I, know I would be. And just one caveat to the detectives, Omegle, you may block it, but during doing this research, I uh, brought up Radner and Omegle, and I found a workaround proxy in the UK. And basically, it's an off-site location that you would go to their servers, download, and then hit the internet that way. So something to be mindful of. Even with parental software packages, there's always work around ways. Chief. We're, we're winding down and, and uh, we're gonna talk about uh, uh, warning signs, but I, I want you to see this for its shock value and then I'm gonna tell you why. 1999, Columbine, this is what really puts school violence on the map. This is actual footage. That's Columbine right there. It gets into a music portion of it. 
It's kind of like a tribute to the, the victims. And some of the video images will be graphic. Anybody ever see that movie, Bowling for Columbine? You know why it was called Bowling for Columbine? That's what they did before they decided to go to school and kill everybody. They went bowling. And uh, they bought their ammunition at Walmart. Just a little footnote to that. And um, there you go, there's a teacher running. And they just very nonchalantly, very casually walked around and decided who they were going to kill. Now let me ask you a question. As you're watching this and what you know about Columbine, how long do you think it took them to plan that attack? Any ideas? A day? A couple weeks? What do you think? They just wake up that day and decide they're going to go kill a bunch of people? Or do, you, or do you think it was something progressive over time that started? Right? So let me ask you a question. How the hell did nobody see these warning signs? The way they dressed, the way they acted, the way they worked in garages of their, of their homes for hours on end, building bombs, getting the ammunition. Look at that. Nobody saw this coming. There's always a warning sign. And, and that's what George is going to talk about after we look at this. That's why I wanted you to see this. You look at this and you're shocked and you think to yourself, how could this happen? You know when people start to exhibit bizarre behavior. You know that. I think they were known as the trench coat mafia. They started wearing black. They kept to themselves. There were so many warning signs that were, that were ignored. Obviously, it's a, a serious problem. Cyberbullying, bullying in general. Uh, there are a lot of indications that the Columbine shooters were bullied. Uh, regardless, it doesn't give them the justification to do what they did. The warning signs we talked about earlier in regards to what parents need to be mindful of, what teachers need to be mindful of. Why are those two groups the most important? You see the kids all the time, Monday through Friday for teachers. Parents, you see them every day. You need to take notice, seek help, communicate with them. Montgomery County District Attorney's Office has a lot of videos out right now. Uh, Ms. Furman, the DA up there, uh, put a book together that was out in the handouts. We're not gonna reinvent the wheel on this. It's a good product. It'll be part of the email blast that we ship out to you. The parts that I found very interesting, it tells you about the, the school law, what your administrators are required to do. Have processes in place for bullying, reporting processes, document, investigation processes. You need to take this serious because if you don't, the potential is catastrophic. As I told, told you earlier, tips for teachers and staff what to do. Familiarize yourself, three minutes, four minutes of reading, and it's there for a lifetime. Tips for schools, very simple. Train all your staff and investigate it fully. And when need be, you call the police. Remember that triangle of support. I took that image from ICAC, I-C-A-C, parents, teachers, law enforcement. We're here to support you, to help you. It's imperative you know your child's password, PIN, Facebook status, friend them, make sure they friend you. Yeah, understand these terms, these abbreviations that Detective Schreiber talked about. That's part of the data I'm going to ship out to you, the 50 top abbreviations, and some of them will boggle your mind. It's incredible what they come up with. But if you can't speak the vernacular, it'll be like going to a foreign country and not knowing what's going on. And you can't afford that. 
in the planning aspect of it, Act 126 came up a great deal, and, and I do appreciate uh, the school district bringing it to our attention. Why is it important? It's not so important to us, but for the teachers and the administrators in the room, it's something for you to wrap your hand around. It's requirements for public and private schools, and part of this, who needs to be trained, why it's important, any contact with students who have direct contact with the student population, whether it's subcontractors or contractors or things of that nature. It gave me a headache talk, uh, reading through this because sometimes they spoke about things, other times they didn't speak about who is qualified. As township and school districts, private or public, it's in your best interest get everybody trained, be ahead of the curve, be the trend setter. And it just goes through the misconduct and why people have to be vetted out. We do background checks on everybody. It's just a continuing thing. It's just the way society is. You don't know where that person came from, what their history is, what their intentions are. So at this time, that concludes the presentation portion. We open it up to questions and answers to the board, to the participants. And I thank you for your time. Chief? You know, when you talk about warning signs, when, when Lieutenant Block was a sergeant and, and the detectives before he got promoted, I remember this one specific case. We had an 18-year-old who carried this ridiculously large, high-powered handgun. And we have an open carry law, which means you're allowed to carry it in public as long as it's displayed and it's not hidden. Uh, you have to be 21 to carry a handgun, but there's this loophole in our, in our law where if somebody gifts it to you, you're allowed to have this. So his parents bought him this gun. And what happened was he was wearing it in a development where he lives, and older women were calling that were afraid that this kid was carrying this open carry. And I call him a kid, 18 years old, he's a kid, right? So I told my detectives, take the gun. I don't care if he sues us or whatever the case may be. I want that gun confiscated. When they went to his bedroom, he had the Confederate flag. He had the Second Amendment. He had that slogan, out of my cold, pry the gun out of my cold, dead hands or whatever. Pictures of girls wearing bikinis, holding machine guns. This kid had a problem. And he came in, he wanted his gun back. He said, it's my constitutional right. I said, I don't give a damn what your constitutional right is. I'm not giving you the gun back. And it wasn't until his father came in. And I said to his father, your son has problems here. Your son has some severe problems. Are they warning signs? You're damn right. For an 18-year-old kid to have that kind of mindset, he's a potential problem. So there are the types of things you have to look out for. So what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to, if somebody raises their hand, I'll hand the mic if you have a question and then we'll just pass it to the next person. Anybody have a question or a comment? Not too close to your mouth. Um, yes. You mentioned all these sites, but one site that you didn't mention is at Ask FM. And the problem with that is that it's anonymous. These other sites like Instagram and Facebook, you make a post, you know who's writing it, unless someone takes your phone. I have an 11 and a 13 year old and I know more about what's going on than they do in their schools because of the monitoring I do. But with the Ask FM, I found things that are, are just unbelievable. And you know, part of the problem is I don't know what to do about it when it involves other kids, but I've seen things that involve my kids that they haven't seen. And you know, just comments on other people's sites, my, I won't allow them to have one because it's anonymous but it doesn't prevent someone from writing about them on someone else's. And it also involves people from multiple schools and states, you know, that know each other from camps. You know, what can we do about this? Well, let me, let me just start and I'll just ask anybody to jump in. There are so many of these sites that we can't keep track. In fact, when we did a story about that Omegle, I was getting ripped in the remarks column of the Radnor patch because people said, how come Colorado doesn't know about this? How do you know, how, how could you know about every one of these sites? It's impossible. So anybody want to address? Um, like who do you contact when it's, when you see something that's from another, you know, if it's uh, within the same school, but if you know that it's someone from, you know, another school district and, you know, two different, how, how do you, who do you contact? What do you do? Well, to, to start off, I guess, to answer your first question, there is not a whole lot we can do about 
the creation of websites and the anonymity of websites and who can post and, you know, gathering that information. There are international websites. Some, you know, these places are in some really sketchy areas of town that don't have any rules about the Internet. Um, but what you can do, if, especially if it does involve your child or involves your child's friend or you hear of something, is report it. Um, there is an anonymous cyber tip line uh, that goes through the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and it's cybertipline.com. You can call 1-800-THE-LOST, um, and that's also, they do missing children, but you know we deal specifically with exploited children, and you can fill out an anonymous report um, if you want to be anonymous to report something that might be going on, and that goes directly, if it's in Pennsylvania, it goes directly to myself or to Nat Evans, who's the other analyst uh, that I work with, and we have affiliates all across the state of Pennsylvania. We also have affiliates um, throughout the United States. Every state has an, an ICAC. Um, so we do investigate that. That is our only job. Um, and then the, the detectives look further into it. If it's a participating website, um, they're reporting it anyway if they see anything. But the, the problem is if it's an international site, they're not required to report. Um, that's the United States law. But they're required to report to the National Center if they see any type of exploitation. So it's a scary world out there. The Internet is scary. And the only thing you can really do is monitor your children. If you see anything, you can report it. You can report it to the local police, um, and they'll send it to us because we have more experience with that. Um, but really, the only thing you can do is monitor. I think the problem is that when it's, it's more subtle, you know, a threat is a threat. But when something's subtle, or you as a parent know what it is, and I mm -hmm. monitor, and I find things, and I prevented them from seeing it, so they don't know it's there. But it is there. And you can't prevent them from seeing everything. Right. Or from other people telling them, but these subtle bullying mm -hmm. that may not appear like bullying, and and it's also um, you know the they use it for grooming as well. Um, you know these can go on; these cases can be a year of grooming. You know, grooming children for you know exploitation purposes, but the bullying as well. You can be completely anonymous. The best thing you can do is report it. You know, we can execute search warrants if they violated the law and see if we can gather their IP addresses and we can actually locate the people by their IP addresses. Most websites do hold on to that stuff, but some don't hang on to it. Some only hang on to it for 24 hours and then it's gone or it's gone instantly. Um, so we're dealing with a lot of roadblocks on, on our end as well. But the best thing you can do is monitor your kids and then if you do see something, even if it's something slight and you don't think it's anything yet, you can still report that. We'll still look into that. Um, you know, we take every uh, tip that we get seriously uh, because you know you may think it's like a 13-year-old chatting with another 13-year-old, and it's not. But in most cases, it's not, and that's what that's what we see. That's what I see all day long. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, I wonder if the schools and, and I'm talking about Radnor High School and maybe the middle school, are asking for some of this, these, these presentations to be shown to the kids, especially the suicide one. Um, you know, I realize some of it can't be shown to the kids, but, um, and I know they're really busy, the teachers, but I think it's so worth them taking 30 minutes to show every kid in the school every year footage like that. So that they and and to have somebody go in and talk about the ramifications legally of bullying, um, you know, we parents meet about this all the time and we talk about it all the time. But we really have to get the information to the kids. I, I agree with you 100 percent, and I guarantee you, nobody's leaving this seminar feeling good. This is depressing stuff, isn't it? And it's very riveting. But um, I'll let uh, Sergeant Smith or Lieutenant Block maybe address that about the schools, if you like. But We've had good communication with the school district. I don't want to speak for them, but they have um, departments that are very active in, and involved with it. Uh, during our meeting to formulate this, we sought input from uh, Radnor School District and got a lot of positive uh, direction from it. So there are, are things, obviously, we're the police department. We don't know the inner workings of Radnor School District. So it's something you may want to voice through the appropriate principal or higher up and, and go in that direction. But we've had positive interactions with the school district and you know, benefited from their knowledge. 
There are representatives here this evening from Radnor uh, School District. Kevin Kane's here in the audience, too, so you can speak directly to him. They're very proactive in this aspect of, of you know, child safety in the schools. So uh, feel free to speak with him after uh, tonight's presentation. Thank you. That was excellent. I really enjoyed what you uh, what you presented. Although it was disturbing, um, I, I provided uh, laptops for my my two oldest daughters when they were about nine or ten. And it's only been in the last six months I've begun to realise what a huge mistake that was. When my oldest daughter, who I you know never had any issues with, you know, um, law abiding, rule abiding um, student. Um, I started to see some things that I was disturbed by. And so I took her computer away and I looked at it. She deleted all her browsing history. But diving deeper, she'd created a Facebook account that I didn't know about. Um, she created Twitter handles that I didn't know about. And um, yeah, then she started lying about it, diving deeper, looking at what she's been, she's been doing. It's really disturbing, um, which is why I'm here today. The problem I've got is, and I really welcome some advice, is her mother, we separate, um, doesn't want to look at anything she's, she's doing online. She spends most of her time at her mother's house and part of the time at my house. At my house, she's, she's watched like a hawk. But at her mother's house, there's um, you know, absolutely no monitoring of her online activity going on. She's not here tonight. How do I get her mum to realize what's going on here? What advice do you, do you give in that situation? Well, I'll just start out by saying there's an old expression, it takes a village to raise a child. And, and <laughs> She's got to be on board. I mean, I don't know any other advice to say, you know, and if she's not going to be on board, then maybe you're going to have to seek other avenues to make sure she's a better parent. But does anybody else have anything else to add to that? Um, other than installing, you know, some type of net nanny software on that laptop that you did provide for her that way when she's not with you. Um, which I'm sure she's not with you, you know, even if she was going to school every day and coming home to you every night, you're, you're not going to be able to monitor that. So I definitely say install some, some type of software and, you know, provide, you know, some warning tales, um, you know, to her mother as well. Just, just this week, uh, I had a case that came in. It was a cyber tip that came in in Pennsylvania. And it was, um, there were about 35 short Twitter videos. You can create these little videos on Twitter. Um, of a 13-year-old girl, um, take, she took of herself, nude, uh, masturbating, doing lots of weird things that a 13-year-old, you, you wouldn't think they were doing. At first, I thought maybe she was being coerced, uh, and that was my concern. There's another player in this. Well, I spoke to the detective that you know went to the went to the house, spoke to the juvenile. She, people called her called her ugly, and so that's why she was doing these things. Clearly, that's not the exact reason why, but the parents had no idea. She's a beautiful young girl. I mean, athletic, involved. You could see, you know, I found her Facebook page. Everything seemed okay. But she was posting these images of herself, this child pornography videos of herself for everybody to see. Like, she didn't realize that. And, you know, we, I've seen YouTube videos, self-produced videos of seven-year-olds. I mean, they are not quite sure what they're doing. They need a lot of monitoring, and that's all I look at all day long. So, you know, send her some tales of woe. Yeah, uh, maybe anything, that would. Did you save anything that you pulled off your daughter's computer? Yeah, but she refuses to look at it. She says that's not yeah. what we should be doing. Definitely get some type of software um, on there so that you can block that stuff from, you know, from her getting on there, um, just to prevent any any type of police knocking on your door, because that's what's going to happen. Maybe you, you want to scare her with, with the law where anyone between the ages of 12 and 17 can be charged uh, for taking, image, you know, taking images themselves of other people. Having images of other juveniles between the ages of 12 and 17, you know, you're going to get a knock on the door and you could get charged for that. So maybe you want to throw the law at her and, <laughs> and scare her that way. Um, that's you know, one suggestion. And don't, and don't forget what Sergeant Smith explained to everybody, these are computers. You can do everything on a laptop that you could do on this, and that's the reality. Education and software. You can have it installed. It'll be transparent in the background. You're the only one that has the code. It'll pull up the history. You can block everything. Active parenting is it. If you don't get the secondary parent involved, you, know, you can only do so much. Can lead the horse to water. You're not going to make them drink, and you hope it 
it doesn't jeopardize her safety, but doing what you can do is the, the right start. Anybody else? Do you want to see anything? All right, well, if that's it, I just want to let you know that this is going to be available on a DVD. If anyone would like a copy, just email us, and we will be glad to give it to you. Thank you so much for participating in this, and we are going to keep this going. And Sergeant Smith, anything, any if, last comments? If you need anything, my cards are up on the table. Email me. Make sure your email is there. If you don't want to take the time to put your email there, take a card, email me directly, and I'll get you whatever you need. Okay, I thank you for your time. Thank you.